convenient. Uh, Kevin Evans is our scene and miscellaneous technology expert. Heavy tech. That's Eric Flint, who is the boss. The boss. Gord Huff, who usually is our um, economics guy, but today he has a little different role. Um, and Chuck Yannon, a new 1632 author who's writing the next. Who's also a boss. Cool. <laughs> novel, who's also a boss, and he's going to be talking later because I'm going to throw an entire subject to him. Can I say an opening remark? Yeah, I want you to. Okay. I'm the author who started this. And just so everyone understands, as far as I'm concerned, this is weird tech. <laughs> <laughs> I, in a long tradition in science fiction, I am a technical. Um, You're a machine. I don't like on. these modern gadgets. Electrons hate me, it is true. Yes, he will we, we've established that. At least the ones in your phone. And no, his computers. No, and computer. my computer. I have my computers will go glitchy for all kinds of reasons. Oh, you're, you're not anywhere call. near as bad Rick, as Rick, an expert no. on it. Basically the lights dim as he goes by. He once said to me, nobody has problems like this. And so, I will well, get So anyway, another joke. Yeah, this is why I don't, I sort of let <laughs> bad men uh, kind of come up with this. I like it just because I'm, uh, Part of author history that that is fun is seeing what kind of really weird technological stuff comes up. And in the case of the 1632 universe, you have a, a, a modern year 2000 American town, and it, it's it's a town with not a lot of college people in it, but it's a working class town, which means you got a lot of people, a lot of mechanical technical skills. Go back in early. 17th century, which is still late enough historically that the population is mostly literate at the beginnings of the, you're not quite at the Industrial Revolution. This is not a mini <coughs> society, it's, it's early modern society. So there's a very ripe ground for a rather rapid development of technology. But what happens is the level of knowledge that exists very quickly is much, much higher than the technical ability to translate it directly into what we're used to. So you start coming up with all kinds of weird alternatives. And, and that's part of the fun of the series. And now I'm going to shut up and let, like I said, the weird guys. Can <laughs> I say something? Yeah, about fire away. I want to, one of the things that I want to tell you right up, right up front is that even though it may look like some tropes from the steampunk genre, this isn't steampunk. Every single thing, every single piece of weird tech <laughs> that we have ever written about actually works in the real world. Um, we don't have steam-powered nuclear reactors or uh, um, uh, and, well, and strange things like that. This stuff actually works. Yeah, the mechanics have to work. That's the. Yeah. Yes, I especially like the one with the floating battleship. Because <laughs> I want to know how they got it up there. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, I did the volume calculations on that. Um, we sure actually we've actually gone so far working. as to build things, and to, so that we can prove to ourselves that this stuff will work. Um, as as the as one of the minions, my my day job is uh, I'm the editor of uh, uh, the most prestigious. Uh, magazine about automation and controls uh, in the in, in, in North the America, industry. and um, so my job is to figure out how to make st how to control stuff, how weird tech automation might work, um, and that gets even more intriguing. Uh, um, and I'm the I'm the guy who uh, thought up the, the you know, water powered computer, <laughs> right? Which, which we'll be talking about. Which actually does work. Yeah, and we'll be talking about that a little bit. Okay. So, um, so as as it says on the slide, you know, the rule when we when Eric started the 1632 book when he first started the book back in 1999, um, he got on his forum at um, Bain's bar and said said you know I want to do this time travel thing and I've got questions I can't answer so he threw. A whole bunch of questions out to the community but very early on a couple of decisions were made one of the decisions was that as much as possible this is 
with the exception of the time travel event, you know, you have to have the science fiction part. But That's the, alien space bats. We yeah, know that. With, with the exception of that, this is as real as we could make it. And we've bent the edges some, but, but it's pretty real. So we took a real town, Mannington, West Virginia, in April of 2000 and picked it up and dropped it into central Germany in 1631 at the height of the Thirty Years' War, which is a really cool time, as Eric said, to put people in there because Galileo was not yet quite on trial for heresy, and Richelieu had not yet quite met the Three Musketeers, and Charles I had not yet quite been shortened by a foot because Cromwell was a minor member of Parliament from the Finns that nobody knew, and Mikhail, the first of the Romanovs was on the throne in Russia, was Tsar in Russia, and uh, Murat the Mad in charge of the Ottomans. It's a heck of a time, okay? And, and really, as Eric said, early modern, it's the beginnings of where they, we are now. They have machinery. Yeah, they have machinery, they have processes, they have daily there. newspapers, okay? So, so it was a fascinating time to drop our 2000 mining town from West Virginia. So Eric renamed the town of Grantville, but we made up a rule that, you know, Mannington, Grantville isn't Mannington, but it's real close. In 1631, none of the newspapers were daily yet. The oh. most frequent one was three times a week. Okay, sorry, thanks. They did have See what I mean? Um, and so Virginia, what provided an incredible service to us, because uh, Eric started to let some of us write stories in his universe and open it up. And people wanted to write stories. And so the stories were um, odd because everybody wanted to write stories about 18-year-old or 22-year-old special forces operatives with big caches of guns and no relatives. I don't know why. So, so it got to be pretty, you know, or the guy who, the Korean who was accidentally in town with a trunk full of integrated circuits. I like the uh, jumbo jet flying through town. Right, you know. yeah, or the troop train accidentally passing through uh, town. The, so, the so, best was the three master criminals with the FBI in hot pursuit, who just happened to be passing through Mannington on Route 250. <laughs> but North, Northwestern West Virginia, a common escape route for <laughs> and just happened to get caught up in the ring of fire. So, you can't go to Mannington by accident. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been there, trust yeah, me. Yeah, we went there a lot of times. You can't get there by accident. So, so Virginia happened to have a piece of happen to have resources that most people don't have, including lists of the names of people that had died in that county, and because she's a genealogist, and, also, and a piece of software that let her confabulate relationships between people and make aunts and uncles and grandparents automatically. And so she created this list of, matched with the census data, of every human being that was transported downtown. Every one of them has a name and a birthday and an occupation and a military history and an education and parents and children and cousins. So there's 35, okay, there's, there, we started off with 30. Roughly 3,551, I Roughly. That's rough, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's rough, you know. Um, and <laughs> well, someone might have been pregnant yeah. at the time, right? So, so we have 3,500 actual names, which is pretty weird. So that's how far we're prepared to go to try to keep our alternate history in the real world, right? And so, um, but the thing is, in any alternate history, there are going to be the possibility to utilize technologies which were not super popular. There's lots of seats. Someone will scoot over and put two of them together. There's two right up here. Yeah, there's two right up here. So, thank so you. Um, our apologies. It's OK. You were flying. We expect this full for one Traffic's um, a bit of a bit. Now you're going to have a yeah. problem. Yeah. So, I'm so not today. As no, no, you're, you know no, you're fine. Is, there will always be some openings for the occasional bit of technology. And the other thing is, if you know how to do things, you can skip over some of the complicated stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's and really small, all so it's really Victorian machinery. You all have seen steampunk illustrations where there's camps and widgets and knobs and levers and everything going Gears. which way, right? Because the complexity 
was something they had to get through to get to simplicity. And so they can jump over that in a lot of tech. And so we can jump over a lot of the complexity and get to the underlying simplicity, which is kind of fun. So, um, so some examples of odd tech, of weird tech. This is one that we came up with a few uh, years ago, couple, two years ago. Yeah, yeah. This is the Patiala State Monorail Tramway. Yeah, look at the ground. Look at the ground. Count the number of railroad rails. Quantity Uno. Uno. Quantity there is zero one, quantity one railroad rail oh, over there, right? Oh, oh. Sorry. Zero gauge. How does that work? I'm about well. to tell you. Very well. Very well, actually. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the idea is there is a rail, there's a double flanged wheel that sets on the rail so it doesn't fall off, and they balance the cart so about 5% of the weight is carried on this wagon wheel that just rolls along the road. Like an outrigger. Like an outrigger. Why would you do that? To lower the resistance of the load from rolling over the rails. Exactly, because it takes one-tenth the power to pull steel wheels on steel rail that it takes to pull a cart going along a gravel road, much less mud. And but also, but how with much does that side wheel that's got to reintroduce it. It does, but remember, it's only carrying 5% of the weight. So very little. Just not here. It's Just the bicycle principle. The faster you go, the more you stand up. Yeah, too. Yeah, right. Okay. So, so it's only carrying 5% of the weight. And so the monorail, so the they, when they um, first put these into service, they um, prior to this, they were using um, oxen bullocks to, to pull the carts in the tea gardens, and they were able to load them eight times heavier using this technology. Then the ox could pull on the ox could pull with a wagon, which is kind of cool. So what's the advantage? Why not use two rails? Because everybody knows how those work. Why do this? Well, there's two answers. The first one's really obvious. You only have to have half as many rails. If iron and steel is in limited supply, and trust me, in early modern Europe, iron and steel was in limited supply, and the moment the people from Mannington showed up, the demand went for the ceiling, we only need half as much, which is kind of cool. And we know how to build wagon wheels, right? I mean, we've not had the wagon wheels since forever. So, so that actually worked. It was a very clever system. However, it didn't have a lot of utility in our timeline because sadly, oh, here's a really good, see this one? This guy has a little gasoline powered engine that he's driving on the, the rail. With. Yeah, I've seen that in the, yeah. you know, on television they had it in Cambodia. Yeah. You know, and, and right. the abandoned railroad and he just put this little, uh, basically it's a, a boat motor, you know, right. <laughs> that was running the. Right. And, and so, um, now, you'll notice that there's no side wheel on his motor part. There's just a wheel in the front. And then this is this has got two, it's got a Y-frame going to the first cart to keep him from tipping over. And they did that because they, did, they wanted all the weight on the drive wheel so he could get the maximum pull. So, uh, but they didn't really, that was an experiment. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed the text on that. The other problem with this in the real world was it wasn't introduced until 1907. Nobody thought of it. But wouldn't that keep you at relatively low speeds? Well, relatively low speeds, but way better.